Well, when I was a teenager, I became cornered by a bully in a sports equipment storage room, and I had nowhere to go. I managed to kick him in the back of the knee and drop him to a knee, but because of spacing, I just simply could not get past him. He grabbed me and threw me, and as he did, I managed to grab his shirt, and it tore as I flew through the air. After the incident, I spoke to my older brother, and together we went to the bully's home <clears throat> since his brother was on my soccer team and his father was my soccer coach. We rang the doorbell, and the bully opened the door and turned pale immediately. My older brother made him an offer he couldn't refuse, which sounded something like this. If you touch my brother, I will break your face. <laughs> my brother had been my advocate against my adversary, and I could walk past that man without fear, and he dared not lay a hand on me because my brother was my advocate. But today, I have a greater brother, and so do you. Jesus Christ, a brother born for adversity, Proverbs 17, 17. The friend of sinners, our advocate, who pleads on our behalf as sinners. And the sermon this morning is titled, Jesus Drank Your Hell. And I have two points to flesh this out. Point number one, Jesus, our advocate, in chapter 2, verse 1. And point number two, Jesus, our atonement, in chapter 2, verse 2. And throughout the book of 1 John, which is a letter to give us assurance of salvation, John issues a series of tests in his letter. And the first is a doctrinal test or a Christ test in verses 1 through 4. Because someone must have a biblical Christ to have a biblical gospel of salvation. The Gnostics, to whom he is writing about and against, believed in a phantom Jesus, one that you couldn't touch. He was kind of a ghost, but he wasn't the pure Christ, the one who could die and shed blood on the cross. And the second test began in verse 5 is the sin test. The Gnostics stood against personal holiness and righteous living. And they taught, it doesn't matter what you do in your body. It's only your spirit that matters. But John calls his little children to turn a deaf ear to those false teachers and to strive for holy and righteous living. And we must not live or listen to and live like the Gnostics, nor the talking heads of this ungodly world that oppose our God. Amen? We must proclaim the true Christ who is both our advocate and our atonement in his work of redemption. Well, point number one, Jesus, our advocate. John writes in chapter two, verse one, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, John is about 90 years old at the time. He's the last living apostle. And he uses the pronoun my to convey a term of endearment with a pastoral heart. His relationship is beyond a church overseer in one sense, as crucial as that is. He's personally invested in their lives. He loves them. It's a relationship that loving pastors should all be able to identify with. And he says little children. And so John uses this affectionate expression a total of seven times in his epistle, both here in verse 12, verse 13, 18, 28, and then in chapter 3, verse 18, and chapter 4, verse 4. Pastors are to shepherd those that belong to Christ as if they were the pastor's own children. Sort of like if I left my children with a babysitter, when I come back, my children better be in one piece or I'm going to be very upset with the babysitter. And we study to unashamedly and rightly handle the word of truth as pastors, to feed your soul that you may grow in Christ. Our primary job description is to constantly nourish as we preach and teach God's word to you in season and out of season, and to reprove, rebuke, correct, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, making disciples of all nations nations 
for the glory of God. And I see many nations here in this church, and we have many nations represented in our church as well. Amen. And John has two truths he's teaching to his little children. Number one, he says, don't sin. And number two, he shows that scripture overcomes sin. First, don't sin. John didn't write in chapter and verse. He wrote a letter to his little children. Remember the strong warning he previously gave to oppose Gnostic philosophy. In 1 John 1, 8, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then he raised the volume in verse 10 saying, if we say we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar. And on the heels of these warnings, he says, don't sin. Well, well what is sin? Well, 1 John answers that question in chapter 3, verse 15, which states sin is lawlessness. It's insubordination. It's refusal to submit to God's law. It's cosmic rebellion against a holy God. It's serious business. 1 John 3, 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Christ came and suffered to destroy sin. And Paul said that Christ died to purify for himself a bride in Ephesians 5. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. In Titus 2.14, therefore, whenever we sin, we join those who call the cross foolishness because the cross purifies us from sin and gives us victory over sin. And hear this, when we sin, this is what we're saying to God. You, me, everybody you know who is living for Christ is saying this, Lord, I do not regard your suffering as a sufficient incentive, motive, or reason to prevent me from doing this, so I'm going to do it anyway. We who know better, when we sin, we're saying, I, I know you died for me, and I know you're all I need, but I'm going to do this anyway. You ever think of sin in such ways? Our sin suggests the nature of Satan rather than God's nature in us. Not that we have a satanic nature in any way, but it shows that we're kind of dipping in. To, we kind of want to go back to Egypt for a moment. The Christian no longer loves sin, but he loathes his sin. He hates his sin. It becomes to him as a deadly serpent whose shadow is to be avoided. And so John is basically saying none of us are perfectly sinless and highlights God's cleansing for our sin. Some can gravitate to extremes in respect to sin, such as some try to live uh, in uh, a solitary life away from sin, and then they fail to evangelize one soul for Christ. Many live hopeless, believing, you know what, my sin, it just could never be conquered. Others confess their sin, and they still feel guilty. Perhaps God hasn't forgiven me. Many isolate themselves. They don't want to be around God's people because they'll say, I'm, I'm not worthy to be among God's people because I've sinned. If that were the case, none of us would be here this morning, would we? The other extreme is called antinomianism, meaning no law. That's complacency, sinning to our heart's delight because Christ won't forgive us. Since, because Christ will forgive us, we say, sin's no big deal. It's like having a get-out-of-jail-free card in Monopoly. And John addresses the heart attitude concerning sin because we are to be insulated from the world. We're not to be isolated from the world. Our water is to be in the boat of this world. We're just not to take the water from this world into the boat of our lives. Do you avoid sin in whatever forms you know yourself to be weak and susceptible to? You know the triggers in your life. You know that if I do this, or if I go here, or I talk to this person, or I look here, you know, that's going to trigger in me. So you know your weaknesses, and I know mine. And the enemy knows all of our weaknesses. And wants to exploit those weaknesses and draw us in. Our flesh craves some of those things that we left. Charles Spurgeon illustrates, some birds dip their wings into the water and then fly back up into the skies while others like ducks can swim or dive under the water. The Christian just sometimes touches with the wings, the streams of earth, but then he soars back up to where he should be. 
It's only when the sinner can swim in, it's only the sinner that swims in sin and delights in it. Secondly, Scripture overcomes sin, which is why John says, I'm writing to you so that you may not sin. He is writing Scripture to teach us from sinning. And Jesus quoted Scripture when tempted in the wilderness, did he not? In Matthew 4 and Luke 4, God's Word is a two-edged sword that proceeds from the Lord's mouth. God's Word should be a deterrent from sin and not a license to sin. Charles Spurgeon again said, sin is dejected in the Christian's heart, though it is not ejected. Sin may enter the heart and fight for dominion, but it cannot sit upon his throne. Does sin sit upon the throne of your heart this morning? 1 John 1, 9 reminds us that Christ is faithful. He is true to keeping to all of his word as he is completely dependable utterly faithful. We are his, and he made a covenant with us in his blood. 2 Timothy 2, 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He is just, because our sin has been paid for in full by Christ on the cross for all eternity. We are the elect ones, the bride of Christ. John called Christ our advocate. And the word advocate is parakletos in the Greek, or paraclete, and occurs five times in the New Testament. Does that word sound familiar to you? It should. It describes the Holy Spirit four times, but here it refers to the Lord Jesus himself. And it means one who comes alongside. All men stand guilty of unrighteousness and need Jesus to be their advocate because he and he alone is the righteous one. This advocate is sinless, undefiled, and spotless in his nature and in all of his action, and there is none like him. And there are six matters displayed pointing to Christ's perfect fitness as our advocate. And first, it shows us he's a divine advocate. He is our advocate with the Father, and that word with is a Greek preposition, prose, meaning closeness in relation or proximity, speaking face to face in closest intimate fellowship with. No mere prophet, priest, king, not even angel in heaven could be our advocate. This is why Rome's ridiculous notion of looking to Mary or other saints negates the cross. I was just in Rome several weeks ago and told our tour guide All of this is built because people misunderstand the scripture and look to a pope and look to this Roman system. And she said, you mean I've been understanding this wrong my whole life? There is one mediator, one advocate, 1 Timothy 2, 5. We needed a sinless man that is also God and only one could meet the qualifications needed to be our advocate. Jesus is the one is one with his father and one with his church. Acts 4:12 And there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He is the name above all names Philippians 2:9. And Peter said in John 6:69, 6, Lord to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the holy one of God. Is there any advocate in all of creation that can argue more forcefully, perfect, perfectly and victoriously than Jesus Christ? He's also a relational advocate. He says, we have. It's a present tense word, meaning it's an ongoing advocacy, not something we once had past tense and no longer possess. He is a comforting presence. He sits next to us in the courtroom. He never speaks against you. He pleads your case with full knowledge and sympathy. He sympathizes, not empathizes with our weaknesses. If he were empathetic, he would be as one who would enter into our pain, but incapable and unable to help us in our sin. He would be as one who jumped in the water because we fell overboard, and he would be incapable of rescuing us because he jumped in too. But Christ is not empathetic, but he is sympathetic. He becomes like us and rescues us from our sin. 
Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. As we have fallen overboard, if you will, dead in our sin, he didn't dive in. He threw us a life preserver called his grace and he threw and he drew us to safety by his hand and then he breathed life into us and made us alive. And now we can draw near to him in confidence, assurance, in the continual grip of his grace. You are a trophy of his grace. He will never let you go. Amen? You are a trophy of his grace. You might look in the mirror and say, me? I'm not as holy as the person sitting next to me. No, no, no. That's not the standard. He's forgiving them. He's forgiven the person sitting next to you of all their sin. He's forgiving you of all yours if you are in Christ. He's also a sinless advocate. Jesus was personally sinless. Hebrews 4.15 says, yet without sin. Hebrews 7.26 says, he is holy, innocent, unstained, separate from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He can stand before the presence of God from which all sin is excluded as the only one that needed no advocate for himself. When he stood before Pilate, he spoke not a word in his own defense. But what happens when someone says something against us? What do we do? The little lawyer inside of us, our nature pops up and tries to plead our innocence, whatever it is. Jesus needed no little lawyer inside of him. But yet, when Jesus met his accusers and crucifiers, he met them with silence. Even as the prophet Isaiah wrote 700 years earlier in Isaiah 53, 7, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Now understand this. Why is this so crucial? Because if Jesus defended himself and proved his innocence, he would have won that argument, would he not have? He would have suffered no shame. But you and I would have lo been lost and remained guilty for all eternity. Ponder that. Thank God for the silence of the Lamb who spoke not a word in his own defense. For that's why we're sitting here today. Because he willingly went to the cross as an innocent Lamb. He's also a loving advocate. And our earthly courts the lawyer, the advocate, stands with the defendant and pleads his case for him. He offers evidence, examines witnesses, and objects when there are violations in the proceedings. He speaks for the client as if the client were speaking for himself. When the judge asks the defendant to rise, the lawyer stands with and besides him. In a capital crime, the life of the defendant is literally in the hands of the advocate. The advocacy ends when the trial, when the trials and the appeals have all ended. Have you ever heard of an advocate serving the sentence given to the defendant if they're found guilty? I don't think so. No, he walks away. He walks away, but not our advocate, not your advocate and not mine. He doesn't walk away. He suffers the penalty for our guilt. He lays out his very life for us as his sheep. John 10, 11, while we were yet guilty, his love was demonstrated for us in that he died for us. Romans 5, 8. Usually the client pays the advocate, win or lose, but here the advocate pays with his life for us. Romans 5, 18 and 19, Paul displays through Adam's sin, all men were condemned. If our president declared war, we would all be at war because he's our federal head. And in similar fashion, when Adam sinned as our federal head, his sin spread to all of us. But for those in Christ, Christ's obedience, his active obedience, his passive obedience made us righteous. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. You see, in his act of obedience, he as a man 
never violated God's law, never for a second. He lived perfectly righteous under the law. Christ pleads before the Father. Adam is no longer their advocate. I am. I am. And I am the one in whom you are well pleased, Father. Some complain, why do I deserve to inherit Adam's sin? I didn't do it. I didn't eat from the tree. But who dares to complain? Why do I inherit Christ's righteousness? No one complains about that one, do they? There are none. Have you inherited Christ's righteousness this morning or do you sit here in Adam's guilt? Because you can either sit in Adam's guilt and unrighteousness or you sit in Christ's righteousness and there is no third option. There is no in between. His forgiveness is an act of his justice being served. Now justice smiles and asks no more, says the song. There is a courtroom scene here in 1 John, which Steve Lawson describes the prosecutor as Satan, the accuser of the brethren day and night, Revelation 12.10. God the Father is the eternal presiding judge, and the condemning evidence is our sin. God's law has been clearly violated by each of us. The wages of sin is death. Jesus as our advocate, our divine defense attorney, pleading before the court, his perfect substitutionary atonement that he paid upon the cross. The outcome is a full acquittal, total exoneration. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Isaiah 1.18, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are like red crimson, they shall become like wool. No sin debt collector is going to come banging on your door demanding your sin debt must be paid because Christ paid it for eternity. The case can never be appealed. It is settled forever in heaven. Your case has been dismissed. Amen? He's an anointed advocate. He has the power and the authority to plead even more than Esther did before the king for her people. He's a high priest, whoever lives and pleads for me. When I was in high school, I started up a Bible club up in the suburbs of New York, and our superintendent said it's illegal to have in school, although my principal was a Christian, and he said it was fine as long as the superintendent signed off on it. Well, he kicked it out. Well, for three months, we met in a church down the street instead, and finally I got a lawyer, and the lawyer pleaded my case, and I stood before the school board with a letter from a lawyer, put it down before all seven of those on the school board, and within one week, we were back in the school, and I went on the loudspeaker as a young teenager and said, praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Bible club is back in session and starts today. Praise God. I didn't have the words and the eloquency, even though I studied the laws, to go before the school board, but the lawyer did, and the lawyer won on our behalf. We have a righteous advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is able to be my substitute before the Father, the righteous for the unrighteous. I am covered from head to toe with my living and dying in Christ's care. And it was the Father who sent the advocate. And he pardons all that are, all that are covered by the blood of the advocate. He has never lost one of his sheep. He pleads the merit of his shed blood upon the cross with the Father for his bride. You are his bride. You're his bride. You're he died for you, died for me. And he pleads our case. And there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Satan can no longer bring an accusation against the bride because they are the bride of Christ. He is our head. He's not going to let anyone touch his bride. I cannot have an advocate, though, 
unless I've sinned. So I must fully confess my sin. And because we still sin, what can we still do? Right? He takes us on as, as his client because we've confessed our sin to him. He continues to be our advocate. And we continually confess our sin before him. John Calvin said the intercession of Christ is a continual application of his death for our salvation. And in 1 John 1, 9, we are to confess all our sin because of who Christ is. Faithful and just, having made a blood covenant with us, 2 Timothy 2, 13. Since he paid for our sin, it would be unjust for us to, have pay, to pay for our sin yet again. It's been paid for. You don't have to pay for it. Nor could you, because you would have to pay for it for all eternity, and you would never finish paying for it, would you? This is why hell is an eternal punishment. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the best way of not sinning is positively to be living the godly life. And that means walking in the light. In other words, it means living for God's glory. Spurgeon said, if the devil comes to you and you get into an argument with him, he will beat you for he is a very ancient lawyer and he has been at that business for so many ages that you cannot match him. So what should you do? Send him to your advocate, the Lord Jesus, and say, talk to him. Amen? Talk to my advocate. Don't talk to me. Is Christ your advocate today? Or will you try to advocate, advocate for yourself? In which case, you will lose in the sight of a holy God. For what evidence will you put before God to show any reason that he should pardon you? Look to the advocate. And so we looked at Jesus as our advocate, but also point number two, Jesus, our atonement. Verse two, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, this word propitiation, what does it mean? And I, I want to make this word so clear that a child can understand it. It's a Greek word, halosmos, meaning appeasement or pleasing someone who is angry. It was turning away of anger by offering a gift. So if a child disobeyed their parent for a moment, and then the child said, Mommy, I'm, I'm just so sorry for what I've done. And the mother or father says, that, that, that's okay, honey. I appreciate you coming to me and telling me what you've done and been honest with me. And so now the, the parent is appeased at that moment. They're satisfied that the child has come forth and um, try, try to make amends, not just in what they've done, but in the relationship, because there's a relationship rift that is that happens a lot of times when children disobey their parents. It was often used by the pagans in antiquity. When disaster struck, it was often thought that there was a God who was angry, and therefore he's punishing his worshipers. This is the mindset of the boat that Jonah was on, right? Everybody pray to your God, and then the captain runs down and wakes up Jonah and says, you know, pray to the God that you serve. And Jonah's thinking, I'm running from the God, and he's, he, I'm trying to sleep, sleep it off, and you're telling me to pray to, to the God I'm running from. Somebody must have the right wavelength. And then when Jonah came to the surface, he told them what to do, throw me overboard, and the storm will cease. And so the remedy was to offer gifts as a sacrifice to the gods without delay. But biblically, propitiation means appeasement necessitated by sin. God is holy and righteous, and he can't tolerate our sin in his presence. Let's look at propitiation from an angle, though, that we normally do not often do. We usually think of the effect of the cross in light of how we benefit as sinners. As sinners, Christ's redemption has bought us and been applied to us. Forgiveness means his death has pardoned us. His justification means that Christ imputed his righteousness to us. God reconciled us in that he made peace with us who were rebels and in doing so adopted us who were formerly children of Satan and children of wrath and brought us into the family of God. And here's the big question though. What effect did the cross have upon God himself? Propitiation involves the Father, the first member of the Trinity. And how is divine 
concern far exceeds our own. As his thoughts and ways are not ours, but as the heavens are higher than the earth, so his ways and his thoughts are higher than eyes. Uh, ours, Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. Why is propitiation necessary? Because God's holy and we're not. We have sinned and God must be satisfied. And we are first introduced to blood sacrifice in Genesis. After Adam and Eve sinned, they try to cover themselves with what? With fig leaves. But what did God do? He slayed an animal and covered them with the skins of blood sacrifice to cover their sin and clothe them. Then Cain would come along and bring an offering to cover his sin. And what did he bring? Something from the ground, just like his parents did. His parents brought fig leaves and he brought things from the ground. And God rejected both him and his offering. Abel brought the blood of a slain animal, most likely a lamb, and offered it to God, and God accepted it. But then Cain turned around and killed his brother Abel. Abel's blood offering pointed to Jesus Christ. In Exodus 12, 7 in Egypt, God told his people, take some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and the lintel of the house. And in verse 13, God said, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you. When I strike the land of Egypt, and in verse 23, the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two Doorpost, the Lord will pass over and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house to strike you. You see, God demanded the blood of the sinless lamb to avert his wrathful plague in the killing of the firstborn. And then after leaving Egypt in Exodus 25, 21, it reads, and you shall put the mercy seat, hilasterion, on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I give you. But listen to the language from the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, which says, and you shall place the propitiatory on the ark above. And in the ark you shall deposit the witnesses, whichever I give you. And I will be known to you from there. And I will speak to you from the propitiatory in between the two cherubim that are on the ark of witness, even in accord with all I may command you for the sons of Israel. We are incapable of fulfilling God's prescription. Yom Kippur was the yearly sacrifice made for Israel the day on the Day of Atonement. Millions of sacrifices were offered throughout history and never once did they satisfy God, perhaps only pacified him. None of those sacrifices ever paid for one single solitary sin, but they all pointed to the one sacrifice that would. Hebrews 10, chapter 4 says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. If it could, why was it repeated all the time? If it could take away sin. God wants a sinless blood sacrifice, not good deeds, not our best efforts, and only the blood sacrifice of Christ suffices. That's the only thing that pleases God. Martin Luther initially hated the Apostle Paul for writing Romans chapter 1, especially verse 17, which reads, the just shall live by faith, because he didn't see it as good news. He saw God's righteousness as demanding the punishment of sin. But when Luther realized, when God opened his eyes to see the good news in it, and he saw it in his true light, it was as if a window to heaven had been opened up before him. He realized God's mercy magnified God's righteousness. God's mercy magnified his righteousness. He poignantly asked, what is it about your own miserable works and doings that you think you could please God more than the sacrifice of his own son? The most damnable and pernicious heresy that has ever plagued the mind of humanity was the idea that somehow Humanity can make themselves good enough to deserve to live with an all-holy God. 
Yet is that not what all the religions of the world teach? You can earn your own salvation. And as a 13-year-old teenager coming out of Roman Catholicism, when I heard for the first time, if all you had to be was a good person to go to heaven, Jesus would not have died for your sin. The light bulb went on for the first time in my mind. Pfft, wow. And, and God had to do it. I was only 13. I knew nothing going through Roman Catholicism. I knew not a thing about God. Luther had it right, but God had to open his eyes. What is the nature of propitiation? Isaiah 64, 6. Our righteous deeds are like filthy, polluted rags or garments, which many of you may know was the descriptions of a woman's menstrual rag. But let me paint a more horrific picture for you so that you understand the intensity of Isaiah's words. Paul Washer shared that leprosy was not only a disease in Scripture, but it is still a debilitating disease today. If there was a leper here this morning, you would have smelled him or her instantly prior to entering the building. They would have been a mass of blood, rotten flesh, and pus oozing from their body. In Scripture, lepers had to practice social distancing, staying six feet away from any human, even from one's own family. Like many loathe. Lepers, God loathes sin. It's repulsive to him, and it bans us from his presence. This is the illustration God gives us in regard to the unregenerate, unconverted man. Isaiah said of himself, I am undone. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He could not use his filthy mouth to speak the praises of God because God's praise could not flow from sinful sewage. This is why the coal had to touch his lips so he could speak God's truth. And Jesus said in Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So as a New York City public school teacher, I remind my students that when they're cursing, the reason it's coming out is because that's what's on the inside of the heart. When they say it slipped, I said it can only slip out if, it's, if you slipped it in. Before a holy God in a holy heaven stood he before the God of light, which John describes in 1 John 1.5, which exposed and illuminated his sin before God. There is nothing in man that could be pleasing to a holy God. A leper could try to clean himself up, wrap himself up in the finest white silk to make himself presentable. But corruption will bleed into the silk until the silk will be just as defiled as the man. Good works can never save you, but they certainly can only condemn you. Out of a corrupt nature comes forth corrupt deeds. Romans 3, 23 to 26, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. None of the world's religions can claim this. Muslims cannot claim that Allah is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Because God is just, but his justice must be satisfied. And no religion in the world has an answer for how that could take place, except for Christianity. We deviate from God's law. Either we fail to do what it commands or we do what it forbids. Everyone that has ever lived has broken God's law and is under a curse. What does it mean to be under a curse? Apart from Christ, our final reality before we take our first step into hell would be all creation rising to his feet and applauding that God has purged the earth of us. Galatians 3.13, Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 
Steve Lawson said every sin in the history of the world will either be punished in hell or punished in Christ. God can still be just and the justifier of the one that is faith in Christ because our sin is punished in Christ. Everything in creation obeys God except for man. Again, Paul Washer states, God commanded, let there be light and the light said, yes, Lord. He commanded the sun, moon, and stars and their courses above, and each reverently, reverentially bowed down and all submitted to his will. He told the mountains to be lifted up and the valleys to be cast down, and they honored his every word. He commanded the mighty seas of the earth, you'll go this far and no farther, and the water said, yes, Lord. But he commanded all humanity, come and obey me. And we said, no. We had the audacity to say No. Started all the way back in the garden when our forefathers said, no. We do not merely miss the bullseye of God's holiness, but the distance between God and us apart from Christ is as far as the east is from the west. Is it any wonder the soul that sins it shall die, Ezekiel 18, or the wages of sin which you have earned is death, Romans 6.23. You see, when you share the gospel with the lost, do you urgently press these truths upon them that their problem is not evidence for God, their problem, their problem is not lack of happiness or satisfaction or getting the job they want. Their problem is they rebelled against God. Are you, and are you more concerned that the gospel will offend the lost sinner or that God will be offended for you perhaps being unwilling and unloving to urgently press it upon their soul? The number one reason that people don't share the gospel with others is because they're afraid. What is the worst thing that can happen to the sinner who dies apart from Christ? Well, they experience the wrath of God for all eternity in hell. What's the worst thing that can happen to you? They don't like you. They make fun of you. They walk away from you. Who has it worse? We need to let love swallow our fears and share with them anyway. You see, superficial evangelism never deals with the heart. It never deals with sin. It never deals with the depravity of man. Recall in Matthew 21, 12 to 13, Jesus came into the temple. He's angry at how temple worship has been corrupted into a money-making scheme from which the true services were all but entirely gone. And he flips over the tables and drives out the money changers and says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. The temple was the center for seeking God's truth and his grace and repentance. But their outward worship was cloaked in unrepentant sin, intensified with religious hypocrisy. They had no idea the ultimate price for sin was not in what they were selling, but required the payment of the very one who flipped over the tables. That was the payment for sin. They totally missed it. The sacrifices heaven gave was Jesus' life as a ransom for many. How can you stand before a holy God in a holy heaven that has no darkness and only makes perfectly divine verdicts? Do you want to be judged by your deeds? By no means. Well, the good news is Christ is our propitiation. And so what's the net gain of propitiation? It's everything gained minus expenses. Everything gained minus expenses. We pay nothing. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He has washed it as white as snow. Many interpreters feel that propitiation is a misleading translation for the word because of its overtones to a pagan concept of God. Some pagans even sacrifice children in the fire to appease their false gods. Some say expiation is a better word than propitiation. The prefix ex meaning out of. Expiation has to do with removing something or taking something away. And there is our guilt taken away through the penalty of Christ atoning, offering, and sacrifice. The word pro means for. Hence, propitiation brings about a change in God's attitude toward us. Recall how Jonah wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. And yet upon their repentance, God caused within them, his wrath was averted. 
What can wash away my sin and appease God? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hence, propitiation and expiation were both done at the cross. In the garden, Jesus asked for the cup to be taken from him. But what was in that cup? Well, to answer that question, we have to go to Jeremiah 25, 15, which says, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. The nations deserve to drink God's wrath. But for God's people, Jesus drank your hell. Jesus drank your hell. He consumed God's wrath and nailed your sin upon the cross and canceled your sin debt, Colossians 2.14, by the power of God's Holy Spirit. God the Father had momentarily forsaken his son because his love could not be at the expense of his justice. No angel could have fulfilled the payment. A sinless man had to pay. A sinless man that was also God. He is the spotless lamb. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And we know for many right now, the wrath of God abides upon them, Romans 1.18. Everyone you know apart from Christ, the wrath of God sits upon them and builds and builds and builds and they'll have no excuse. That's why all of that needs to come off of them. And if you're familiar with Pilgrim's Progress, when he went to the cross, the burden fell off. How much wrath does God have for the ungodly? Jonathan Edwards describes this in Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He says, if you were to die this moment and be like a spider on a puny web dangling over the flames of hell with no escape and throughout all ages to come and be made to face relentless pounding and unleashing eternal fury upon the damned souls in hell for eternity, what could you do? Answer, nothing, nothing. Only the hand of God himself could keep you safe in his care. And only one that belongs to him would keep him in the grip of his grace. God grabbed that little spider's life and it would not be even singed by the flames and made you his own child. Amen? The question is asked, how can one man suffering a few short hours on a cross under God's wrath, make an eternal payment for a multitude of men and save them for eternity in hell. Well, God poured his wrath out like a laser beam upon Christ in the span of three hours from 12 noon to 3 p.m. He snuffed out the sun, the S-U-N, and everything went pitch black as Christ was baptized under the full weight of God's fury against God. The one that died on the tree was the ruby of righteousness, the gemstone of heaven, the precious son of God, worth more than all men put together. He is an infinite and eternal value such as no man has ever known. Christ is our greatest treasure. Is he your greatest treasure right now? Or something else more valuable in your heart than he is? Because whatever it is, it's chump change compared to Christ. Who among us has such impeccable virtue, merit, piety, and worth compared to the Son of God himself? In Psalm 22, it speaks how Christ was forsaken. And it says God is holy. And then it says Christ is mocked. He's poured out like water. In verse 16, it describes his hands and feet as pierced. And many don't realize it wasn't the physical death of the dreaded Roman cross. It was the wrath of God that he drank down. Jesus drank your hell. That's today's sermon title. Jesus drank your hell. Death momentarily ceased him and many mocked him. But how can you now mock him who not even death can hold, who stepped forth out of the grave of victory? How can you mock such a man? Muhammad didn't get out of his grave. Neither did Buddha or Krishna or Joseph Smith, Charles Hayes Russell or the Pope or anyone else. Jesus said, here I am. I'm alive. You don't believe me? Thomas, put your fingers. Touch the holes. Touch my side. Again, John writing that to show 
that the Gnostics were terribly wrong because you couldn't have a physical Jesus if he was a phantom. Noah and his family should have drowned with the rest of humanity since sin's seed was in them. Job should have perished with his family. David should have died for having been a liar, an adulterer, a thief, and a murderer. Abraham came from a family of idolaters. How could God save Noah and spare Job and call Abraham to be his friend and pardon David and adopt him as his son? Answer, because the son of God, he died for them all. He was their advocate and the one that pleased God by his atonement. First Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sin in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live in righteousness. The end of verse two says, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Who is the hour he was referring to? Well, John says this is little children. The whole world meant the Jews and the Gentiles that would come to Christ. That's the whole world. It didn't mean every single person in all of humanity. In the same way, if I said the Yankees won the World Series and the whole city came out to celebrate in the parade, well, that doesn't mean every single person came out of the stores, out of their homes, out of their apartment. It only means those who came out into the streets to celebrate consisted of the whole city. And for the whole world, it's all of those who have come to Christ. That is what comprises the whole world. His elect. If he died for the whole world, then why would he separate the sheep from the goats? Why would he in Matthew 7, 23 say, I never knew you, and they profess him to be Lord. Many are called to salvation, but few are chosen to salvation. We call them when we go out and evangelize. Come to Christ. We plead for them to come to Christ. But only those that come are in Christ. Robert Candlish said of these, they are not debarred from the wondrous fountains filled with blood, but can with full assurance plunge in it afresh. God has turned his sword of punishment against them into a shield of protection for us. He didn't make people savable on the cross. He saved a people on the cross. In conclusion, realize this. Jesus drank the hell that you and I deserved. We have been saved from God, for God, and by God. And Jesus is both our advocate, our divine judicial defender and atonement, our propitiation, appeasing God's wrath, and washing away our every sin. And why? Because he loves the Father, and he loves his little children, his church. And John admonishes his little children not to sin, but to walk in the light, as he, God, is in the light, to preserve Pursue holiness without which no one will enter heaven. He doesn't want us to sin, but he paid the ultimate sacrifice to pay for our sin and to keep us from sin. We must say no to sin and not so easily cease from fighting against our sin of greed and lust and pride and bitterness and anxiety and worry and jealousy and anger and the like. And let me leave you eight practical reasons why we should not sin by Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says, number one, God hates sin. It opposes his holy and divine nature. Secondly, sin is wrong in its own nature. Number three, sin is a foul thing that caused Christ's suffering. Number four, sin dishonors the gospel, its claims, and its power. Number five, sin is utterly inconsistent with our profession of Christ. Number six, sin always leads us to an evil conscience. Number seven, sin will lead to doubts at will at times, make you feel uncertain about your assurance of salvation. And number eight, sin leads to hopelessness. And that is why these New Testament epistles are written and why John writes this one to us. Do you walk in holiness? Do you say no to sin? Do you fight against it? Maybe even having to call somebody up and saying, I'm just, I'm so weak right now. I want to do X, Y, and Z. Will you pray with me right now? I just feel absolutely powerless. If you don't pray with me right now, I'm, I'm going to enter into this. And secondly, do you warn family, sinners, co-workers, friends, that God will punish them apart from Christ? I have a co-worker I've been sharing the gospel with, and he said, well, you know, when I die, I'm going to 
use, he said he's going to use me and someone else he knows and a, a family member that's a priest and he's going to use all these people as his advocate. I said, that'll never work. I need an advocate. Certainly you cannot use me. And if you're not a Christian, you don't have an advocate this morning. You don't have atonement for your sin. You cannot advocate or atone for yourself. Come to Christ now. Today is a day of salvation. Repent of your sin now and put your trust in Christ's cleansing power that he might be your advocate and atonement. The blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin and can bring you into fellowship with him and his church. Let's pray. Christ is greater than all our sin. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. Make us bold to preach the gospel to every creature. Since we know there is no limit in the value of Christ's atonement, though still we know that this design is for the very chosen people of God alone in his definite atonement upon the cross. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.